on November 18, 1970, in the heart of Africa. Mr. and Mrs. Akwanga were the proud parents of a baby boy. They named Ebenezer Bongo Akwanga Jr. When their son was born, he was born like any other child in the world, with the potential to make the sky the limit. The Akwangas expected no less for their son and immediately went to work to give him all he needed to make the sky the limit. But the sky above the one-time United Nations Trust Territory of Southern Cameroons under British administration and now under La Republique du Cameroon is not any other sky in the world. The Southern Cameroons has become a territory whose land, air and sea has no limits for anyone except those who God in his infinite wisdom had chosen this piece of earth to bring them into the world. Some have speculated that the tragedy of Africa is the tragedy of a lesser man created by God to populate the rich continent of Africa. This speculation coupled with or enabled by skin color and the late arrival of Africans to the quest for knowledge in the modern world has created uncertainties that have enabled exploitations and untold miseries to be visited on the people of Africa without consideration and without consequences. As she was moving towards the house, she, she was shot by the back and that was all. She fell down. You can see her eyes and everything. All those things. She fell on stones. Not that she had anything with any law officer, any quarrel with anybody, nothing. Today, a lesser man occupies the continent of Africa. Not by the making of God, but by the making of man. And the first one has died. And the second one is the one we have just talked to. And the third one will be talking to him later. Was this one shot at the back? He was shot on the back. On the back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What keeps the African a lesser man varies from country to country and region to region, depending on the power and control. The problem we have out there is that by some conspiracy of the European past, two distinct peoples were forced to become one. And what is happening is that those of English expression have been put, have been put under the French sphere of influence. 
and the French sphere of influence is doing everything to abuse the privileges they've known, to distort the perception they have about life, and to reduce them effectively into second-class citizens in their own country. The victims were shot, and you, as you can find there, you have bullet wounds on the vehicle. That's a bullet wound. Then the second one is fine. The second bullet wound there. That's where Banta Hillary was shot and killed. This is where one of the victims, Banta Hillary, was shot and killed. The next morning, he was found still in the sitting posture, stiff, right inside, inside the vehicle. Right inside, inside the vehicle. The CPDM politicians and the parliamentarians went up to Kambi and alerted the, the police or the gendarmes earlier on that the rally might take place. And so when they came down, really prepared for war, as I saw it, uh, they discovered that the rally was not taking place. And it was at that juncture that they switched over into a, what we call a mock uh, type uh, tax drive. And so that is where the problem really started. And there was a certain gendarme who came, stood at that road and then uh, whistled. And then the rest of the, the gendarmes or armies rallied there. And then from there, they met for this house. And then here, he started breaking things. Completely destroyed. Everything on the ground, ground in pieces. You can see. Pieces of bottles, glasses. The clock broken. We went into the room and then collected a big safe. And then uh, four cartons of uh, rims of papers. The clear cut situation of gross human rights violation, of inhumanity from man to man, let me say beast to man. Because what has unfolded in the Anglophone territory and on Anglophones, the southern Cameroons, is not something that you will see that human beings do. That's something that beasts, only beasts are capable of doing. You will see all the irony in the people here. They simply cannot understand why, why tax drives can, can cause the burning of beds, because beds do not pay tax. I will run, because they're the big women there. They're just the big women. They're the naked them. Mm -hmm. The bed is all bent, and their family is only standing outside now. Uh, yes, well, you have tax tickets for how many years? For nine years. The Republic of Cameroon police have always been terror agents and defenders of the ruling oligarchy and its despotic dispensation. They are complete strangers to the ethical role of a civilized police service as peacekeepers and public protectors. One of the mothers who escaped and went and delivered in the bush, and that is the baby in the hand she's holding. You be wrong, go for Usai, madam. I be born for route from Garo. I go born for road today. You go born for road? Mm -hmm. For inside bush. For inside bush? Yes. Now, who behave you for there? So, mommy, we just come up to the farm. There's way we go to the farm. Then you can take the picking for it in my hand. You can take picking for your hand? Mm -hmm. We be where you don't already born already? That's the honor of that TV there, that part. You can find how the things were scattered and broken down into pieces. Papa, now where did it happen? You gave your tax ticket for this year? Everything correct. You have a civil servant, you pay now. Then broke your television. They broke my television, they broke my radio, flask, everything for us, windows, all the window glasses, table, chairs. Now them do where they do. This is how the people of Africa are managed to ensure that nothing disturbs the old and now traditional role assigned to them from the outside since the days of European colonial control. The territory we are talking about, which is generally referred to as the Southern Cameroons, is one part of a country which at one time was administered as a German colony. 
But Germany haven't, Germany haven't lost the war. In 1916 and again in 1945, uh, this country was divided between Great Britain and France under the auspices first of the League of Nations as a mandate and subsequently of the United Nations as a trust territory. One part was administered by France and the other by the United Kingdom, both of them as trust territories. of the UN trusteeship system was to prepare the trust territories for independence. Uh, that was done in all the territories, including ours, including Southern Cameroons. But rather curiously, when the time came for us to accede to independence, the same United Nations, after receiving certification from the United Kingdom that we were ripe for independence, decided rather curiously that we would accede to independence, but only on condition that we choose either to join the neighboring Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, which had obtained independence a few months previously, or our neighbor on the other side, namely the former French Cameroons, which had also acceded to independence a few months before. since then, what we didn't understand then, and we still haven't understood, why uh, it was understood that on attaining independence, uh, a condition like this being attached to our independence. In my part, part where I come from, if uh, they find out that uh, a military officer, a policeman, a soldier, or whoever, is a carrier of AIDS, they'll transfer him there give him clean money to get onto little girls and make sure that he spreads. So I got to a place where the Reverend Sisters told me that, Mr. Chairman, look, <clears throat> uh, the AIDS pandemic here has gone up to 80%. And when I stand and I'm talking to a population of about 5,000 people, and it occurs to me that 80% of these people will die. Today, 42 crusades who are all francophones are appointed in southern Cameroon. They rule us like captured people. They beat and fed our children. They rape our school, our children in school. This cannot be accepted. We had a system which was the only system where a government could conduct an election and be defeated by the opposition. Dr. Indele conducted an election that was defeated by Foncha from the opposition. Nowhere has it happened in Africa. Nowhere. To show you that the system was thorough. It was typically British style. The political leadership of Republic du Cameroon has never aspired to establish and has no intention whatsoever of establishing a free and open society based on common bargaining, on goodwill and on good faith. There was Hitler, there was Stalin, this there was Idi Amin, these are the examples. And Korea is well on the road to get into that exclusive circle, he's already there. So it is important that this day of today should be marked as the day when something comes destroyed. And you think, say, do God, it will send person where it will move we from this trouble where we did it now. I think we send them up here from you. I've given you all my love. I've given you all my sweat. I've given you all my energy now. I've given you all my love.
Article 76 of the UN Charter limits the trusteeship system to only two alternatives for a state. You either develop the state to self-government or to independence. This is our story. It is a story which the British, as administering authority, saw differently. They did not see independence or self-government for the people of Southern Cameroonians. What they saw was the integration of Southern Cameroons into Nigeria. It was Ian McLeod in 1960 who told a delegation of Southern Cameroonians who went to London that in his considered view and in the considered view of Her Majesty's government, there can be no better future for the Southern Cameroons than going back to Nigeria, and that if they insisted on another course of action, sovereignty will be transferred to Republic of Cameroon. Ebenezer Bongo Akwanga Jr was a child who had all the makings of a better man. But the circumstances he was born into gave him no opportunity to experience God's gift to him. How a one-time United Nations trust territory given to Britain to prepare for independence or self-government for half a century ends up taking orders from its government through interpreters and forced to observe foreign flags fly their skies is a story which like many stories that have made the African a lesser man comes from outside the continent to impose itself on the African. Ian MacLeod the colonial, uh, British colonial secretary in 1961 sold our country like a cattle ranch. The records are there, the names we're talking about sell our country like a cattle, cattle ranch to the goal to annex to French Cameroon. guys go in, they torture our people, they kill them and they come out and they broadcast what they have done. Promotion comes in because of your personal body count. That's how you are promoted. And that is a reality that our people face. And we are accident victims that the world ignores our, our grievous wounds. The army itself 
wins its spurs for bravery by its cyclical massacre of defenseless civilians. Suffice it to say that it is very sad commentary on British stewardship in the Southern Cameroons that as a deliberate policy the British government to its everlasting shame consider the Southern Cameroons and its people quote expendable relegated to junior official discussions and decisions on even critical matters affecting the Southern Cameroons and in complete disregard of the territory's best interest, presume to transfer the said territory for recolonization by La Republic du Cameroon. As a trust territory of the United Nations, Southern Cameroons fell under the terms of Article 76, Subsection B, which defined the goals of the trusteeship system. The basic objective of the trusteeship system in accordance with the purpose of the United Nations shall be to promote the political, economic, social and educational advancement of the inhabitants of the Trust Territory and their progressive development towards self-government or independence. The uh, United Kingdom, upon reporting to the United Nations that its territory was ripe for independence, nevertheless uh, took the view that these two territories, Northern Cameroons and Southern Cameroons, were not economically viable so as to be administered uh, as sovereign independent states. What happened was that the British did not want our little Southern Cameroon to become a communist controlled country. The process of destroying Southern Cameroon's government, economy, and all the institutions that gave the people of the territory their livelihood was vastly aided by the events that preceded French occupation. The contemplation of these unfolding developments might be more than an interesting political exercise were not the geography and the forces at work so significant. No part of Nigeria is in such a vulnerable position as the southern Cameroons. No region is subject to the variety of tensions and outside influence, particularly communist, as is the southern Cameroons. Momie's recent association with Sekuture and Nkrumah in Guinea presage activities in the two Cameroons. Surely the communist forces, awakened to the importance of Africa, must eye the area of the Cameroons with the same intense interest they have displayed in Guinea. No such opportunities exist in Nigeria now. They do in the Cameroons. Because when the UPC were chased from French Cameroon, and they came out to our own British Cameroon, the KNDP formed an alliance with the UPC. When the UPC were again chased out of our country, they went to Ghana, mm -hmm. and they created a rapport between Ghana and Foncha. Today, from now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. So when Foncha became prime minister, okay. this was a stage was set where if our country became independent, the UPC would come back and use our territory as a haven for the anti-French guerrilla warfare that was going on to overthrow Ahijo. And we again rededicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it links up the total repression of the African continent. The United States of America, Department of States, Washington, May 11, 1959. Dispatch number 440 from Lagos, document number 751U.00-5-1159. 
the Southern Cameroons is far more important in the context of fast-moving African events than its population of 750,000 and area of 16,581 square miles indicate. The territory is a frontier, exposed as no region of Nigeria is exposed to communist-inspired influences, which can become a danger of serious magnitude. This reason, not to speak of its great potentialities, makes the Southern Cameroons an area of serious concern to the United States. So, from that perspective, the French did not want British Southern Cameroon to become an independent state and become a haven for the UPC terrorists. It was now time to disregard the law and disregard the interest of the people of Southern Cameroons to protect foreign interest. The British Secretary for Colonies led the charge. There can be no question of obliging the Cameroons to remain part of an independent Nigeria contrary to her wishes. The options open to them would be to continue under trusteeship administration of the UK. In the options of remaining under trusteeship, he also made it clear to Southern Cameroonians that you would not thereby be given the golden key to the Bank of England. Many of the best friends of the Southern Cameroons do not foresee a destiny more likely to promote her happiness and prosperity than continued association with Nigeria. The British representative at the UN later issued the same warning, stating that secession of Southern Cameroons from Nigeria would raise formidable problems which he did not think would be solved from the territory's own resources and that Britain would not support the idea of a separate independent state for the Southern Cameroons. One doesn't know where the concern uh, of economic viability and all that uh, came from as a, a determining factor uh, with regard to the decision whether to grant a territory independence or not. But as of 1961, there were many territories which were either independent or being prepared for independence, and which subsequently acceded to independence, which were less than 800,000 strong in population. Now, on the economic front, equally, I mean, we know countries that acceded to independence in Africa when they were described simply as groundnut economies. Uh, it, is, it, is not, uh, it is by no means certain that they were any richer than the Southern Cameroons was. The British, and it is in, in their own records, that we will co become, come under the influence of Nkrumah and the Soviets. That will threaten their right to continue exploiting the Cameroon Development Corporation, where they were making millions. Furthermore, they did not want a, a country like ours to become independent because Nigeria, they had managed to put Nigeria under a stooge. Um, uh, Tafawa Belewa, who was the hand-picked um, uh, agent of the Sultan, uh, Sultan, uh, Sultan of Sokoto, uh, Sadauna of Sokoto. Now, with the communists at that place, it was going to be easy to destabilize that arrangement by which Britain stayed in, Britain, in London and ruled Nigeria through Tafawa Belewa. So, there was a four a four-point conspiracy against us. Ahijo and the French, Tafawa and the British. These two were against our independence. So Britain found one excuse or the other to stay on them, perpetuate a trusteeship that had expired by operation of the law. And in so doing, facilitated the recolonization of Southern Cameroons by yet another foreign country. When, when you face a situation that you believe is um, being caused by you not having all those rights which are due to somebody who is a human being, you, you start to ask yourself, what has made me, what has placed me under this situation that I am like an animal, like a slave.
the story of Ebenezer is inseparable from the story of the land in which he was born. It is a story of man's inhumanity to Africa, started in the slave trade hundreds of years ago and continues today in a more complex setup that continues to deliver the same goods to the same masters year after year, generation after generation for more than 400 years today. He has been striving. Mm -hmm. He has been striving to be, to live a free life, a life of freedom, a life unfettered, unfettered by, you know, laws that dehumanizes him. Man is born free, but everywhere in chains, said a Frenchman a long time ago. Today, the French are free after violently shaking off their chains of bondage in the French Revolution hundreds of years ago. The African remains in chains everywhere he goes. That is, what can we do? What should we do? What the British took away from Southern Cameroons became what was taken away from each of its citizens, the right to self-determination. He's basically fighting as an individual for his God-given rights. He acquired primary and secondary education like any other child in the world. But as he reached adulthood, he quickly realized that the fight for him was not the same for any other youth in the world. All through his life, um, that is the situation with all the Southern Cambodians, the Andrew folks, that you are delivered, we, a generation, were delivered into slavery. We're delivered into a situation where we have no rights normal human beings as people of the world. And I think that when you look through the life history of Beneza, it is a microcosm of what many Anglophone youths have faced. The rights of the, the life of them fighting against the odds and he has been one guy who from birth has fought against those odds, fought for it from his primary to secondary school right up to the university where he was put, he was dismissed from the university by the agents of La Republic du Cameroon. You see, in a system, in that system, that entity that they called Cameroon, the Anglophones, we had no university. Mm -hmm. For over 40 years, the intellect of our people, those who want to go to, wanted to go to the university had to move into neighboring countries, or move to Europe or America in order to get higher education. Or you go and you mix into the University of Yaoundé and try to learn French and from there you try to get to, to get the university education. So after nineteen ninety-two, after a great, you know, that great battle over the years that culminated in um, 92 with the Anglophones, the Southern Cambodians going out, protesting for a, GIS, a, a general certificate of examination board and for other things. The government has, to placate them, created a university, the first Anglophone university in Boya. And as pioneers of, those, of that university, Ebenezer was elected the student union chairman, the student union president of the, the, the first batch of the Boya University. And as the pioneer student union leader, he played a pivotal role in opening up that university for the Anglophone students. When they created the university, the government, the government's hands was forced. They did not want the Anglophones to have a university. 
So they went out of their way to deprive the University of Goya from all normal aids that the government should give. They did not give that. We, did, we as pioneers, of the, we did not even have classes. They had to take the restaurant, separate it with plywood for us to have little classes to sit in. The administration will spend the time, most of the time, and our teachers going around the southern Cameroonian territory, begging parents to contribute money so that they will come and build little classrooms for us and they put, you know, benches for us to sit on. So it was a pathetic situation. The library, the, 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 there was no science laboratory. We have to go to secondary schools to get laboratory. So you see, as the student union leader at that time, at that, at that moment in time, Ebenezer had a pivotal role to play, and that that came into sharp focus when the government tried to increase the, the, the fees for um, of the anglophones in the University of Boya. You get a situation where there were about six universities in Cameroon. Due to the fact that government did not want to give aid to the University of Boya, but was giving aid to the other universities, they came into the University of Boya and they tried to increase the fees, fees by about 400 percent. Because under normal circumstances, students in the other university, in all universities in Cameroon, were paying about 50,000 francs. But they came now and they tried as much as possible to make the University of Boya students to be paying 350,000 francs. That's a more than 500% increase just for that university. And that is when Beneza put his legs down that this will not happen. There have been enough deprivation of the Anglophones all through our lives as students. We came up from a culture where our, our parents pay our school fees, even in, in what or supposedly government schools that they don't pay school fees. They have to institute PFA, PTA fees. Or pay PTA whether it's 10,000, 15,000 or 20, some some even go up to 30,000 francs. We have to pay them to keep those schools functioning. But the government will claim that those are government schools, but it's apparent that we're doing it. So to bring this now into the university, we said that no, but we have reached an age where we can think for ourselves and we can look the real we can face the reality of the situation that this was a deliberate government policy to keep the anglophones under slavery because it keeps our community in a perpetual state of poverty and they can die. and that's when Ebenezer stood stood up for that and said that no over his dead body would school fees in the university be augmented and the students as one followed him you know and for that and for that victory that he gained in the university he had to be made a scapegoat and dismissed the story of southern cameroons is a story of all the contradictions that come together to reduce and keep the african less than his god made him in a world that continues to demand more and more from its inhabitants just to maintain the status quo. The other one is covered, which means that everything inside was also damaged. They are just covering it because of the rains here in June. And uh, you will also see even broken down vehicles here. That is to say, if people are dying, they will be removed and persecuted. Even that the other one too, the windscreen or something. In this uh, Tuta station, you have replaced the glasses. The glasses were broken down. I said the, even the Janam did not need to forever themselves. So uh, we will want to suggest that this play, this uh, this situation here uh, was not only for taxes. This situation is repeated all over the territory of southern Cameroons year in year out since la republic du cameroon took over the territory 
they can pretend to stay in the background and put a man of your color on top there and give him instruction. And he takes the instruction from France to treat us. The African has not been allowed to have his own revolution and evolution like France with all the powers of the world converging to make sure it does not happen. When he was dismissed like that, it automatically blocked him from uh, the other universities in Cameroon. And as a matter of principle, he actually refused to attend any thankful university in Cameroon. After the Second World War, the conscience of the international community was determined to move away from the inhumanity of humans to humans. In Africa, this change of attitude was reflected not by a recognition of the humanity of the African and a genuine redress of centuries of injury, but by a change of tactics that made no difference to the conditions of the African and in many ways made wars what was only bad. They just talk saying, no one here, that one, they're doing nothing, they're talking about English, they're talking about French, and yes, most more. As he talks to another, that other one, the one she picked picture of 89. Then he just start the broke thing, windows them for house. As he broke and finished, they enter, they say, television, dead inside, they move us for house. Then that other man says, make the no, look at the dead. Look at the ass. Take me to him, look at the ass. Take the picture for my late husband. Then it's still broken. After I don't do all these things, then I just can't. Then you just talk to Madam, you want to talk to what? I don't talk to you. You take your food now, you keep him for you in the tissue two times. Then I run for one minute for outside. Then someone say, May I find something, give them so that they know what beat me. I tell you, say, after they don't spoil all these things, I know if you give me something. Even if I get the money. It would be a mistake to see the activities of La Republique du Cameroon in southern Cameroon as initiatives of one African country against another. The Francophone actually is not the enemy. It's a mere tool in the hands of France. And France will continue. You slap, how many of us you can slap, kill each other? They are just there sapping their oil and going away. So you're getting nothing out of that violence. French control over La Republique du Cameroon, its people, and its resources has remained strong after independence in 1960 as much as it was before independence. In an article titled Intervening with Elan and No Regrets, published in the June 26, 1994 issue of the New York Times, John Dunton writes that, France's military intervention in Rwanda is a stark reminder of a diplomatic truism. Among the colonial powers that once ruled Africa, France stands out for its readiness and its ability to dispatch troops to a besieged country on the continent. Why this should be so, more than 30 years after the country's gained independence, is something that even experienced diplomats find curious. It is a curiosity that goes deeper than many have cared to explore and affects the continent of Africa 
the people of Africa and the black race as a whole in many more ways than would seem at a glance. The answer to the riddle of why Paris can get away with action that others dare not even think about lies in the curious symbiotic relationship that France nurtures with its former colonies. Independence was not a rapture with the past. It was more like graduating into an elite circle, an entry into a club, a sedate assemblage of the privileged held together by language, love of the French culture, and the conviction that Paris was the center of the universe. Independence for any African country, for any African, needed to be a rapture from the past littered with slavery and colonialism in which the humanity of the African was robbed and remains robbed. But the people of French colonies in Africa have never had an opportunity to break away from their encirclement and sedation in an effort to make them love the French language, French culture and see Paris as the center of the universe. Since 1962, when French troops rushed to Dakar to help President Leopold Senghor of Senegal maintain order after a coup attempt, France is engaged in more than a dozen major interventions in Africa. Among them were Gabon in 1964 and 1990, Chad in 1968, 1978, 1983, and 1986, Zaire in 1977 and 1978, the Central African Republic in 1979, Togo in 1986, and the Comoros in 1989. There has actually been over 30 armed interventions into African countries by the French since decolonization. In Western capitals, Paris is taken seriously again as an ally who can act in the vast swath of Africa that has four times as many French speakers as France. And as for public opinion at home, as one Western diplomat in Paris put it, here, the government has explaining to do when it doesn't intervene to protect French interests. The Frenchman cannot fly his troops to Canada, Mexico or any other independent country in the world to protect his interests no matter the situation. But the Frenchman flies his troops into Francophone African countries because France never really left those colonies as expected. And the world knows that France never left and so says nothing when France flies its killing machines into Africa as though the God who created the African did so for the pleasure of the Frenchman. The African existing only as a part of the lush African jungle, replenished by rains from the heavens and always ready for the Frenchman to harvest at will without consideration and without consequences. It all came together in a secret document called the Cooperation Agreements. The Cooperation Agreements were agreements written up by French experts after World War II with the intention of guaranteeing French continuous control over the affairs of its African colonies presented by the government of France to its colonies as a precondition for independence. The experts accomplished their job by tying the economics, politics, and social infrastructure of French African colonies to metropolitan France in such a way that the colonies would find it hard to operate without the participation of France in matters of importance to them. There was a Faustian bargain allow in French technocrats to run state enterprises and companies, trade mainly with the mother country, and sign a military assistance pact and you will be secured. France will prop up your economy by giving you the African franc, which is supported by the French treasury, and rush its army to your side if trouble develops. Troublemakers like Sekou Toure, the ranting Marxist who ruled Guinea until 1984, need not apply. The cooperation agreements covered every domain in the colonies, including economics, monetary, military, trade, and population movements. After total dependence was guaranteed, 
by the terms of the cooperation agreements. France offered independence and cooperation to its African colonies, or total cutoff and abandonment. This choice was first presented to Guinea, who quickly rejected it as blackmail. France, in order not to risk another rejection by any other African colony, destroyed the Guinean economy in such a way as to frighten any other African colony, doubting the French resolve to remain in charge even after independence. By the time Charles de Gaulle addressed the offer to the other French colonies, he was addressing a largely converted audience. All the other French colonies in Africa lined up one after the other and accepted the cooperation agreements as drawn up by French experts for their independence. That is the cultural war that we are fighting and that is the cultural war that African Americans and lovers of freedom in the world have to assist us in fighting this cultural imperialism which is a more pernicious form of imperialism. It is worse than financial imperialism. Three years ago today, soldiers in Ivory Coast staged a coup d'etat. That was the beginning of a conflict which flared up again three months ago, and now Ivorians are embroiled in an escalating civil war. On one side are government forces, and on the other, several rebel groups who are now meeting to decide whether to join forces. French troops are there, ostensibly to safeguard the interest of their nationals, but are inevitably getting drawn into the conflict. There would be hell to pay if Britain tried it say if it decided to send a crack expeditionary force to Nigeria. The Nigerians would resist it, the British public would decry it, and the rafters of the United Nations would ring with accusations of neo-colonialism. But France is able to pull off such a maneuver with swagger and elan. No apologies, no obeisance to sensitivities over sovereignty. The helicopters simply swoop low over the banana trees and disgorge the patrols of closely cropped camouflaged young men in broad daylight, almost as a matter of right. Not always did the intervention favor the status quo, when Jean Bedel Bocassa of the Central African Empire became too much of a political liability in September 1979. He was accused, among other things, of murdering school children in jail cells. The foreign ministry dropped him and sent in troops to install someone else. The mad emperor extracted a might of revenge two years later, when the fact that he had given diamonds to President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing became an issue in the 1981 French election. You remember a few years ago, the French went to Congo Brazzaville and removed Pascal Lesuba, the democratically elected president of that country, and put a general, uh, Sassoon Gesu, in power. They went to war and killed people in that country and put their lackey over there. The leaders of French Africa are handpicked by the French. They are not representing the people of Africa. Africa, French Africa has never had democratic elections in that, in that part of the world. The history of Cameroon politically was that the French created a union Cameroonese which was Mr. Hijo's party. That party created people, leaders, who became known because over the years they were imposed on the people without any free and fair elections. When Ahijo was to hand over, when Ahijo was to leave, the same scenario followed the French, arranged for him to hand it over to Mr. Bia who was already a name in the political scene, having held several prominent government positions. A look at the background of the cooperation agreements explains why France wrote them, but they are called agreements. Article 3 of the Atlantic Charter of August 1941 declared the rights of all people to choose the form of government under which they lived. Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, and General Charles de Gaulle, 
the leader of the Free French, insisted this article should apply only to the European countries liberated from the Axis powers. President Roosevelt of the United States of America declared that the rights of self-determination should apply to all peoples and that the United States would actively support this. I come from the Crimea conference with a firm belief that we have made a good start on the road to a world of peace. And I am confident that the Congress and the American people will accept the results of this conference as the beginnings of a permanent structure of peace upon which we can begin to build under God that better world in which our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, the children and grandchildren of the whole world must live and can live. And that, my friend, is the only message I can give you, but I feel it very deep, deeply, as I know that all of you are feeling it today and are going to feel it in the future. The people of Africa were included in President Roosevelt's words. But France was determined not to include them in the hope of the world and among the peoples of the world. The fate of the children and grandchildren of Africans was yet to be decided by a less gracious group of people in an environment less grandiose than the Congress of the United States of America. Charles de Gaulle decided that the only means by which France could reach world prominence after its defeat and occupation by Nazi Germany was to retain control over its African colonies and exploit their resources. In this decision, Charles de Gaulle was said to become the nightmare that was going to bring a long night to Africa at a time when Europeans were still shot in the morning of their own long night and what had hit them. The circumstances that created Adolf Hitler for Europe had become the same circumstances that would create Charles de Gaulle for Africa. Both men could not stomach the second race status brought to their different countries by the defeat of war. Like Hitler, after the First World War, Charles de Gaulle decided he would do what it takes to restore to France a greatness that could not withstand a panzer attack in the Second World War. Like Hitler, he decided that this was going to be accomplished by all means necessary without regards to international opinion, international law, or international morals, without regards to human life, human interests, and human property. Adolf Hitler had decided that the greatness of Germany was going to come from the demise of Europe and Europeans, and from the dehumanization of the Jewish people. Charles de Gaulle borrowed from the same page and decided that the greatness of France was going to be built on the demise of Africa and the people of Africa, and from the continuation of slavery, the dehumanization of the black race. What millions of people, including Africans, had died to give France after Nazi occupation was denied to the people of Africa without hesitation and without consideration. General de Gaulle took a tour of all French colonies in Africa that culminated in a conference now referred to in history as the Brazzaville Conference of 1944. The decisions of the conference were defiant not only of the direction the world had chosen after a racist and brutal war, but also of the African, whose very existence was ignored. The goal of the task of civilization accomplished by France and her colonies 
rule out any idea of autonomy, any possibility of evolution outside the French block of the empire. The eventual creation, even in the distant future, of self-government for the colonies is to be set aside. In greater colonial France, there are neither people to enfranchise nor racial discrimination to abolish. There are populations which we intend to conduct stage by stage to a political personality and for the more developed to political rights. But this will mean that the only independence they will want will be the independence of France. Even God who created man to serve his purpose on earth still saw it fit to give him free will. Ladies and gentlemen, the Grand Mar Chair President of the Social Democratic Front, Honorable Lee John Defro. Instead of allowing a mob of proletarians, more or less badly dressed, speaking more or less French, to grow up through contact with us, we would do better to create an elite, beginning with the chiefs and notables who have been made by us personally responsible for power, will progress by their experience in dealing with the difficulties they encounter, and, as they become attached to their work, will win their spurs on behalf of the country and within it. Is this not better than a crowd of soured individuals bringing in unsuitable slogans from who knows where? Being exploited. That is a job of cultural immiserization. The, the attempt was to re, recreate a Frenchman in Africa. And despite the fact that this Frenchman is going to have a black color, he's going to have a French mentality, and he's going to be proud to be a Frenchman. It was more than creating a Frenchman in black skin. It was creating an agent in black skin to disguise to the rest of the world an evil which the world has clearly and violently rejected, but which the Frenchman was bent on keeping in Africa. All the French governors present at Brazzaville were clear that French interest in the territories will be best preserved in the hands of a political personality who is thoroughly assimilated in the French language and culture through education. After a meeting with President Truman in August of 1945, Charles de Gaulle reported that they had agreed that the rivalry between the free world and the Soviet bloc would dominate everything from now on. The United States of America grudgingly admitted that it might be more expedient to allow the French to resume control of their colonial empire than to bring it under international administration. France was therefore allowed to remain in Africa after the British left and after the Spaniards and Portuguese were beaten out to continue slavery on the people of Africa right into the 21st century. We live under terror today. We live with murderers, maruders, rapists controlling us. The colonization of Africa by Europeans in 1884 just a few decades after the abolition of slavery was actually a continuation of slavery in another form. One larger than the first and this time without the long and costly transportation cost across the ocean. One without housing costs, maintenance costs, and one without land use in the plantations. The status of the African as labor free of cost and without rights remained and continued under colonial control in Africa. This is what President Roosevelt seek to end after the Second World War. After the Nazis took the idea of making one person better off by making another worse off to a new height. But the French rejected this idea. They rejected the idea of free societies all over the world with free markets and free enterprise as the new world order. In their rejection, they succeeded in taking advantage of the generosity of America during and after the war, the death of President Roosevelt, and the threat of communist domination to reject change. The cooperation agreements France forced on its colonies in Africa 
denied the people of Africa true independence and therefore could not be maintained and enforced in a democracy where political power is gained and lost by the will of the people. France has therefore had to create gangster governments, protect at home and abroad to terrorize and extort from its African populations while she remains the main and dominant force, exploiting African resources unchecked and without obligations. It is owned by France. Cameroon is not in the OPEC. Why? Because Cameroon doesn't sell our oil. France it has the right to sell our oil. They fix a price. They don't have to go to OPEC. So you find that the whole thing. If you ask a Cameroon man, a Cameroon man or a legislative, how much petrol is tapped in your territory? We don't know. It is a property of the president. And all that person knows. And they, they can't tell us any piece of work that has been done with our petrol. And we Cameroonians will agree that we have nearly everything we need under the sun in our country. But all these are being exploited by a selected few. Let us look at the timber industry. You'll, you'll imagine all our forests is being uh, de destroyed. They are, they are cutting the woods, their numbers, and much of it has been accelerated in southern Cameroon. The oil exploitation in Cameroon is mainly in southern Cameroon. You'll feel sorry for yourself when you see the way Jean-Christophe Mitterrand is exploiting our forests. The timber is going. The timber is going. And you go up to Molundu, you go up to Yokadoma, where the timber comes from. The people there look like the real species of the baboon. They have nothing to live on. No medicines, no roads, nothing, no schools. I had the opportunity, for example, to talk to the French foreign minister when I was visiting France. And I drew a parallel between France's defense of her culture uh, from the domination of the Anglo-Saxon culture to the southern Cameroonian defense of its rights to exist from the overwhelming domination of La, Fra uh, of, uh, La Republic du Cameroon. And this guy laughed and looked at me and said, Mr. Taco, you make sense from what you are talking, but the world is not what you think. The French will not abdicate something that was handed over to the French by the English. No valid constitutional or other legal basis has ever existed for the unification of the two Cameroons and for the common governance of the two territories. The occupation of southern Cameroons by La Republique du Cameroon came about through a UN-sponsored plebiscite. In 1959, Britain realized that the opinion in our place was that which was going to go against absorption into Nigeria. So they now had to create a scenario where we will vote to join Nigeria. That scenario came by, by introducing the fact that if we do not join Nigeria, we will have to be made to join the Republic of Cameroon. So it if it became independent. So it was like a stick and a carrot. Yeah, so that was the situation. Mr. Foncha, who had just beaten Dr. Indele in the last parliamentary elections on an anti-union with Nigerian campaign and became the Prime Minister of Southern Cameroons, was working hard to represent the prevailing opinion in Southern Cameroons. The main emphasis was on secession from or integration with the Federation of Nigeria, he argued. It will be definitely wrong to include unification with French Cameroon as one of the alternatives to be put at the plebiscite because it is not one of the clauses of the trusteeship agreement. P.M. Kale objected to the idea of a plebiscite. He pointed out that the desire of the people of southern Cameroons to manage their ship of state 
has been a long felt and legitimate need and concluded by stating that his party, KUP, stood for self-government for the people of Southern Cameroons as a fulfillment of one of the basic objectives of the trusteeship agreements. No attention was paid to this view. So our independence now was to be linked up with one of them. First, this was ultra virus because you, the UN had no powers under the charter to tell us to join one or the other. The charter says, lead the people to their self-government or independence. Okay. doesn't say, lead them and get them to join one or the other. We went back to the United Nations. The United Nations still stood for joining the Cameroon and join the independence for the Cameroon by joining the independence of Nigeria or by joining the independence of La the people. Man to man is so unjust, my people. Why can't we all live like, like God intended? Like? The options to be presented to the people of the UN Trust Territory of Southern Cameroons were do you wish to attain independence by joining the Federation of Nigeria? Or do you wish to attain independence by joining the Independent Republic of Cameroon? In these questions, the idea of Southern Cameroon's independence took its last breath and was put to rest. One cannot be independent by joining the already existing independence of another. The Lebesic campaign, Dr. Indele and his party stated that they stood for union with Nigeria and gave 10 reasons why Southern Cameroonians should vote for their choice, amongst which they said, if the people voted to remain with Nigeria, the House of Chiefs would not be abolished. Every aspect of fundamental human rights, as already stated in the Nigerian constitution, will be upheld. On the other hand, if they voted for union with the Cameroon Republic, they would invite a new system under which everyone lives in fear of the police and the army. There was no provision for a self-governing Southern Cameroons. The party went on to enumerate some of the evils of French colonial rule, including the absence of the rule of law, French colonial exploitations and political repression, all of which they said had been inherited by the government of the Republic of Cameroon. The KNDP on its part called on all voters to choose union with La Republic du Cameroon because voting for union with Nigeria will bring two million Igbos to seize their land and jobs. It was the only kind of campaign that was possible. The elections were not about the people of Southern Cameroons and their interests. It was about choosing a new master, and by the tone of the campaign, there was no pretending that the worst days of Southern Cameroons were yet to come. And the plebiscite was well conducted, uh, conducted by the United Nations, and co prepared by the administrative authority. Right now, right now, boy. What's going on with the economy there? Tell the it cannot be that during the colonial, British colonial period, while our people were fighting and telling Nigerians that no, we are not Nigerians, walk out of Enugu, they're walking out to go and then submit themselves for recolonization by another country on the left. It could not be. It is true that the motivation is a more negative one, against union with Nigeria and against Igbo domination, than a positive attraction for the French side. What is that makes me a brother to these people on the other side and not to Nigeria? A people I have hardly ever known. The greatest link the people of the Southern Cameroons ever had with the people of the Republic of Cameroon was when they granted refugee status and asylum to fleeing people from that side. And their knowledge was limited to that aspect. 
Otherwise, beyond that, there was nothing else in common. Nothing else in common. Some have said Mr. Foncha took the people of Southern Cameroons into La Republic du Cameroon like sheep to the slaughter. It was really the British and the UN who delivered the people of Southern Cameroon to the slaughterhouse and turned their backs on them. The people of Southern Cameroons were abandoned without support, without a military, and without any constitutional arrangements to face La Republic du Cameroon with whom France had signed cooperation agreements, military pacts, and had continued to manage the affairs of the country undisturbed. The plebiscite vote was an incriminating vote the citizens of Southern Cameroons were asked to cast for alternatives that did not guarantee independence or self-government. In the U.S., the Fifth Amendment protects citizens from having to make these kinds of decisions, even when they are guilty of a crime. The citizens of Southern Cameroons obeyed the Germans, bore the brunt of British injustice, and submitted themselves to UN control, only to be treated worse than criminals. The union between the Southern Cameroons and La Republic Cameroon has proceeded these past 32 years without any constitutional basis. There are quite a number of people who do not know that there is a 15-page document explaining the meaning of its joining. Without the process of negotiating the terms of unification having been completed, it goes on page 4 to explain. If we join, op opted to join the Independent Republic of Cameroon, then the United Nations would convene a post plebiscite conference, okay. an international conference at which the United Nations, Buya, Yaoundé, and the British authorities would sit down and transform what was agreed uh, between Yaoundé and Buya, which we call the Plebiscite Pact, into a federal constitution. Without any federal constitutional assembly having been having met, without any draft federal constitution having been established, there was going to be a post plebiscite conference organized by the United Nations. Okay. Question I'm asking you is. Has the United Nations organized that post plebiscite conference to this day? The answer is no. Okay. In May 1961, the goal got Ahidu to enact what they call the Federal Republic of Cameroon, a law of the of Yaoundé. May the British were still in our country. Yaoundé passes a law which was to be applied on our country. It is not only illegal, but it is extraterritorial. A law must be, must be, it's only, it's only legal when it's applied within the territorial limits of that country. But when a country takes upon itself to pass a law which will affect another country, that law is null and void ab initio. So basically you're saying that even the federation that was supposed to, that was that existed for 12 years was null and void. It, 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 wasn't a, it was not even a federation to start with. They okay. called it Federal Republic of Cameroon, but it wasn't a federation since Ahijo had the power to appoint and dismiss government in Buya. Many experts on Southern Cameroons have questioned the implications of the UN-sponsored plebiscite vote that took place in southern Cameroons. They state that on October 1, 1961, sovereignty of southern Cameroons was passed out of the jurisdiction of Great Britain, but it was not clear to who that sovereignty was passed. What remains clear is that 
a federal system of territorial administration was instituted in southern Cameroons, headed by a federal inspector who was answerable only to the president of La Republic du Cameroon. The federal inspector had the duty of supervising federal agents and their activities in southern Cameroons and reporting directly to the president. The direct control and takeover of the state of southern Cameroons was affected by a decree passed by Mr. Hijo, president of La Republic du Cameroon, making all district and sub-district officers in southern Cameroons members of the federal administration. As the prime minister of the southern Cameroon, people, the whole of southern Cameroon looked up to me for anything that had to happen. But Aijo had already controlled the, the divisional officers who obey him and refused to obey me. The Southern Cameroons came under French sphere of influence in 1961 with a free market economy, a free press, free judiciary, elected legislature, and executive. This was in conflict with the spirit and intent of the cooperation agreements and therefore unacceptable. The security bulletin was passed over my head to Aijo. So I quarrel with Aijo for hiding the security bulletin from me. And for that reason, when he wanted to take over the police force, I told him, no, I couldn't allow the police force go to him because there were the only means by which I could know what security exist in the Southern Cameroon, or to know how to keep order in the Southern Cameroon. So he left. He could do nothing, but he left until my time of Prime Minister of the Southern Cameroon, which was a temporary period, ended, and I became Prime I mean, Vice President with him. Then he took over the police force. Southern Cameroons had the makings of an independence that was going to be different from the independence of France. And its leaders were not elites created by France and made personally responsible for power. It was therefore necessary to dismantle and subvert not only the democratic and independent institutions of Southern Cameroons, but also the economic system that supported it and out of French control. When we were in school, our teachers told us that on the 20th May 1972, there was a peaceful revolution. But is that true? No. Is that true? No. In 1972, there was a conspiracy, a hijo of unblessed memory, and certain other persons, all natives of La République de Cameroon. And I want to emphasize this point. Ahejo was involved. The guy who was now president of that country, Bia was involved. Singapore was involved. Um, um, Usman May, that's the name. Usman May was all involved. These guys plotted this whole thing, carried it out, drafted in secrecy <laughs> their own constitution, got a certain Frenchman called Mr. Maurice Duverger who came and penciled the thing and all that and so on and so forth. Not only did the Francophone majority impose their will fraudulently on the Southern Cameroonian minority, but they also brought to an end the equality of status between the two founding components of Cameroon. In 1972, the job that had been started informally was formally completed. Our legislature, our government, our House of Chiefs, our judiciary, our police force, all this were dismantled in 1972. The aim was not only that, it was also to exploit and rape our economy. 
It is important that every southern Cameroonian should know what happened on that day. What happened on that day was that Mr. Ahijo, the hand-picked French dictator of Cameroon, decided to unilaterally dissolve the Federal Republic of Cameroon. Successive Francophone regimes have since stepped up the exploitation of our natural resources, especially oil and timber, for which the receipts never go back to our territory. One of the most backward divisions of the backward southern Cameroons in terms of economic development today is Indian division, the very division of whose shores oil has been exploited for the past 23 years and which has been the source of sustenance of the Cameroonian economy and nation as a whole. Worse than that, they have destroyed what we have. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. They have destroyed the effective system of financing small-scale industries and enterprises, which Southern Cameroons had established through the creation of such institutions as the West Cameroon Development Agency and the Cameroon Bank. They killed the Cameroon Bank. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. They looted the West Cameroon Marketing Board, which Anglophone Cameroon set up prior to independence and misappropriated with impunity its huge financial reserves of over 78 billion francs CFA. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. Now we had our own source of electricity, our own electrical corporation power cam, our own production plant at UK, all that was demolished in order to reduce us to total dependence on power supply from far away Edea. The result of this is that few places in southern Cameroon, whether northern or southwest provinces, are electrified today. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. They contrived to squeeze out anglophone business and to maintain an excessive grasp and control over finance and business. They fix the terms and conditions of credits and control access to finance institutions, both public and private. As a result, familiar anglophone businesses staff of credits, such as Fomenki's Direct Supplies, Niba Automobile, Nanga Company, Kilo Brothers, Chair Company, and so on, are no more. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. They closed down our agro-industrial establishments such as the Santa Coffee Estate and later the Womb Area Development Authority and the Obang Farm Settlement. They have taken away from us the responsibility to plan our towns and to maintain in them the high standard of sanitation that used to prevail. They have destroyed the system of local government and of community development which we had instituted in Southern Cameroons. Worse than that, they have destroyed what we had. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. Under the pretext of resurfacing our roads, which were tarred prior to unification, they dug up the existing tar, destroyed the roads, and in that state, abandoned them. As in the case of Kumba Mbonge, and the Kumbatombel roads. In 32 years of independence and unification, the government has not added a single kilometer of road to the network that existed in southern Cameroons prior to unification. Now, neither in terms of employment, nor in terms of commercial activity, nor in any other terms, has Fulara brought anything to Victoria. The employees from top management to Lebra are from Francophone Cameroon. Without adding anything, they have destroyed what we had. You have farmers who have been toiling all their lives to grow cocoa, to grow coffee, and these are products and economic crops that the government has monopoly over their sales because they are export crops. 
The government takes these crops from the farmers, exports the crops, collects the money, and doesn't pay to the farmers. And so you can have farmers for three years running, going without money, even though they have delivered produce which has already been paid for, but the government has not passed the money on to the, on to the uh, farmers concerned. And when the farmers rise up, they want their money, they want their right to sell their coffee themselves, sell their cocoa themselves, the government's answer is violence, use of troops and so on. The possible assumption of sovereignty over the southern Cameroon by refueling the Cameroon amounts clearly to recolonization and its attendant humiliation, exploitation, injury, insult, trauma. We are an oppressed people. We are a taunted and brutalized people. We are tortured physically, psychologically, spiritually. On our heads and on our land hang the dismal shame of nobodiness, nothingness, human degradation, poverty, and backwardness. The Southern Cameroons has not changed one inch ever since the British left 50 years ago. To travel 50 kilometers, you have to take it two, three, four days. It is unacceptable. Generations come and go. The generations of our fathers and our forefathers came and are gone. And for all of us who live in that territory today, it is our own, it is our own time. And people are not born grey. No generation is born grey. The, the greatness comes from the activities of that generation, of the generation. Because when you look at other countries, you look at the United States of America, for example, you will see that the generation of George Washington, those were the great generation, but they weren't born great. They will tell you that the generation of the um, Abraham Lincoln were great, but they weren't born great. They were mere little, little boys. Some of them as poor and some orphans. But they rose to greatness because they stood for certain ideals. The ideal of the fact that we are human. We are humans. And we can stand as human beings to fight for something. And they stood for it. And in that greatness was born. So our own generation, has, that has been thrust upon us fight for that greatness so that our history will look at this generation and say that these are the people who stood up for their humanity. When a people are denied the right to live a life of dignity and freedom, when they are denied the right to control their own affairs and fashion their own destiny, then they have no choice but to fight. Even when he was out of the university, he was still one of us, always to sit down together and, you know, exchange this idea. And that is how the spirit developed that we should try as much as possible to form an organization of youth groups to deal specifically with the inhumanity under which the Anglophones and live. And it culminated in the formation of the Youth League, the Southern Cameroon's Youth League. He came in, played a prominent role from as the, the, the spokesman of the Youth League. And from there, he, after the reorganization of the league, <clears throat> he was made chairman 
of the southern Cameroon Street Lake. One discussion that we had on the 8th of November, the evening that the youth league met. What year was that? In 1996. Okay. We, we, we said that, you see, our people and the youth, that we are really mortgaging our future for a, you know, our lives for a dubious tomorrow. But we should try to change it. We should try to think, you know, about a better today. And to do that, what do we do? We have to go out, sensitize the people on what should be done, and that would be to rise up as one people and throw out the yoke of oppression from our neck. To do that, it will need some sacrifices. To do that, it will need some people actually going on the ground and doing that talk, doing that straight talking to our people. And we accepted that role to go out to our people and do that straight talk. One, no, the, nowhere in this world has freedom been handed on the people on a platter of gold. Freedom must never be handed to a people on a platter of gold. That's one thing that was missing, has been missing all through our history. That no leadership has ever said that to our people. And we accepted that this leadership of the youth league should do that. So we had to go and do that. We also had to go and tell our people that they have a right to live as human beings. That they have a right to freedom. That we are a people, we are the people of the world, the world. Under that, we have the cover of the UN Charter on Human Rights, the African Charter, the, also the African Charter on Human Rights and our God-given rights also. That's something that we had to tell our people. Because it seems, accepting the inhumanity that we live under, that our people have accepted that we are not as equal as a normal citizen of the world. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inherent and inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is to secure these rights, only to secure these rights, that governments have been instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And whenever any government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to abolish it and establish a new one. And Ebenezer, as the leader of the UK, was at the forefront, going out and passing that message to our people a message of humanity and what is going to be needed for us to gain our humanity. And you see the oppressors become so afraid of that message going to our people. And what they did is kidnap him on the, on the field. Kidnap him doing this job. And they kidnap a lot of our people. And they killed a lot of our people. And it's, most of them are buried, are now buried on, on Magrib. 
You see, he took the chairman of the league. He was caught in Bermuda. And from what they will tell you is that Cameroon is a system with the Anglophone system of justice and the Francophone system of justice, which means that caught, um, being caught in Bermuda, you falls under the Anglophone jurisdiction of justice or in any crime that happens in Bermuda, you have to fall under that system of justice. But now these guys were caught in Bermuda in Jakiri, then trans transferred to Yaoundé, and this is in La Republic to Cameroon under another jurisdiction. And the crime was not um, committed there, any crime. So they took them to Yaoundé, they accused them that there were some um, activities that happened, um, they, they, they burned down some DOs and um, buildings, DOs, um, they um, took explosives from Razer, so they said that these guys were terrorists, and these guys were, you know, they use what they normally use, they demonize our people to the international community and to us, and they took them. So they took them. If they were really convinced of what they had caught these guys with, why not take them to court in Bamenda? You don't take them to court in Bamenda. You took them to Yaoundé. Why not go to a civilian court? You take them to a military tribunal. Going to the military tribunal, you tell their defense team, not to mention not to mention the name southern cameroons in court and this is the leader of the southern cameroons you lead that you have caught and you are telling that you don't want to hear the name southern cameroons in court amnesty international is seriously concerned about reports that at least nine prisoners who were among some 300 people arrested in cameroon in early 1997 have died either as a result of torture and ill treatment or lack of medical care. 58 prisoners, including two women, remain in detention. Those detained had been arrested following attacks by armed groups on several towns in Northwest Province in March 1997, in which 10 people were killed. The latest death to be reported was that of Lawrence Fai, who died around 5th September 1998. His death considerably heightens concerns regarding access to medical care for other prisoners who are said to be seriously ill, including Ebenezer Akwanga, who is believed to have suffered paralysis of his lower limbs and impaired vision as a result of torture. His comrade in darkness, Mr. Paul Bia, get into a territory, kidnap children, take them over to Yaoundé in jail, kill them under torture. And they will keep silent. The United the, the, the common world, the righteous common world, silent. The EU, silent. It's pathetic. It's flagrant double standards. He's now more bold than Fletch. Ebenezer is one of the greatest fat leaders of the former British Southern Cameroons that has ever been. I think he is the greatest because that's the one leader that came up and fought for our people. He came up, he looked at 
the situation clearly and he did not allow any illusions to cloud him. He said that this is the situation, this is the remedy, this is what we have to do. That is the first leader of our people that has been that clear and prepared to offer his life for the people of the South of Cameroon. Because of one gain or another land that I cannot define, the international community would accept lies from the regime of Mr. Paul Bia to explain away the Beneza situation. Because they don't want to face the hard choices that the truth will force them to face. We don't have any control. Our business is run by French people. We have all of you educated here working in different places. We don't have any control. We can't do anything for the benefit of Cameroon. Uh, there is a famous quote of Ebenezer. Ebenezer said that he is a small guy, very small. You will not need a lot of space to bury him. But if you bury me there, how many sound Cameroonians are you going to bury? Are you going to bury 5 million sound Cameroonians? In 1961, when Southern Cameroon was forced into La Republic du Cameroon, a federation was expressed and took the name the Federal Republic of Cameroon. Southern Cameroon became known as West Cameroon and La Republique du Cameroon became known as East Cameroon. In 1972, the government of La Republique du Cameroon dropped the name Federal Republic of Cameroon and picked up a new name, United Republic of Cameroon. In 1984, Paul Bia dropped the name United Republic of Cameroon and returned to the original name of La Republique du Cameroon, this time meant to represent not only what was East Cameroon in 1961, but also Southern Cameroons. God took us into that slavery, and God is bringing us out whether they like it or not. When did you imagine a government, they sit down and pass a law, believing that they are now trying to erase the, what, you, what they call anglophone problem. The language of the police is French. The language of the army is French. The language of the National Assembly is French. The language of the courts is French. The language of the uh, Minister of Finance is French. The Central Administration is French. What do you call the, uh, what do you call command? Eh? What do you call it, no? It's all French, 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 French. They, there should be no trace that there ex ever existed another country. Did you did they know? God was trying to get them to revive the sovereignty of that country. Because when two people form a partnership, that partner, partnership is called, called Ambe Chotu Partnership. When it is resolved, and Ambe is, it, it's a, it's, it's, it's re establishing a business of his, the partnership dies mm -hmm. automatically. Chotu is independent of that. It's like a marriage. When you divorce a marriage, eh, one man does not remain married, they become all free. In a constitutive two-state federation, the revival of the statehood of one state necessarily entails the dissolution of the union. The making of modern France has come about through a process of defiance. Defiance of international norms, international morals, international trends, and international laws. This defiance has mostly been displayed in Africa and in taking advantage of people less able to defend themselves and less capable of making themselves heard. It has resulted in crimes against humanity, but there has been no response from the international community because the victims are the peoples of Africa and France is a European country a member of the European Alliance, doing what has been normal for Europeans to do to Africans. It is not a situation where we are trying to carve out ourselves a boundary and to leave a country where we got independence as a unit. 
we came into that union with our own internationally defined borders. The borders of southern Cameroons are not being made now. They are borders defined by international treaties. That is different from what Biafra tried to do in Nigeria. The country that has seceded from the Union is the Republic of the Cameroon, which has seceded. They declared their secession on February the 4th, 1984. It is they who have seceded. And we say you must follow your secession to the logical conclusion by pulling out of Amazonia, or we have to stage a liberation war. It's a decolonization, not a secession. We are trying to decolonize ourselves from a secessionist country which is imposing its rule on us after they have seceded. Please, have this in your mind and not to hit back at those who say you are secessionists. They are the secessionists. They have seceded. And we are asking them to pull back having seceded. Thank you. We shall be delivered out of the Republic of Cameroon House of Bondage to land of freedom. There is an eventuality of the creation, the establishment of La République d'Ambazonie. That is the cause which God has set us for. And we are not stepping one step back. Our goal is one and only one. Our goal is to revive and implement the independence as well as restore the national and international personality and sovereignty of the former British administered United Nations Trust Territory of the British Southern Cameroons. There is nothing that is going to stop us from doing what this goal says we are going to do. And anybody who steps out of here should take word that that is what is going to happen. Nothing is going to stop us. So help us God. And so the people of Southern Cameroons, like most of the peoples of Africa, speak out loud against international injustice, international crime, international double standards, international manipulations, international terror, and their total and complete dehumanization to a world that has moved on to a better and more complex world and looks back at them and wonders why they cannot come along. They cannot come along because they are trapped in an empire whose only language and reason is force. Force of arms, force of deceit, force of blackmail, and force of deprivation that treats the sons and daughters of Africa as though they do not exist in the land in which they exist by God's will. They cannot come along because each move they make in expressing their humanity and the yearning potential trapped in it threatens a foreign power whose future depends on maintaining the past in Africa. They cannot come along because government, whose power is only next to the power of God, is made an enemy to the needs and aspirations of Africans in order for a foreign government to become important in the world. The people of Africa cannot come along because the good health care of a foreign people depends on no health care for Africans. The good roads of a foreign people depends on bad roads for Africans. Their stability on Africans' instability. Africans cannot come along because a foreign people's economic growth depends on no economy for Africans. Their thriving industry on no industry for Africans. Their businesses on no businesses for Africans. Their financial security on Africans' insecurity. Africans have been made unable to multiply in the land in which God put them to go and multiply because the foreign people want to multiply more than necessary and more than they can. And so the dreams of Africans to provide for their basic needs, organize themselves, their society, and go about building their own health care, their own roads, their own businesses, 
their own spaceships and fly their sons and daughters to worlds beyond are held hostage by a foreign power whose actions in Africa violates not only the people of Africa but the very God who made them and put in them what they have struggled for the last 500 years to tell the rest of the world that they too belong here and can go where no man has gone before. The African cannot come along because the rest of the world has moved on as though Africa does not exist. Africa is here and the question remains, is the African a part of the human family on earth deserving a place like a lot of latecomers who have been seated and enjoying the fellowship of belonging or is he truly a lesser being, unable to cope with a generous and compassionate humanity that surrounds him? I want a solution, what to this baby revolution? Oh, God, give me resolution, what give me life and give me freedom? Oh, God, we don't want to kill our scars, fighting in them morning wars. They don't really care about we, they use me for more money, 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 money. Do you see behind the lines? Yeah, 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 yeah. Will you see what they have done? No one who we are. Will you choose to stand and fight? This is war. Will, Will you choose, choose to, to carry a gun? This is the revolution. I want a solution. What to this everyday pollution? Well, I'm gonna give me resolution. Oh, give me that, oh, give me freedom. Oh, oh, oh. oh God, this pain up in my every day. Watching my blue skies turn gray. Oh, just keep protecting me. Deliver me from the reality. Do you see behind the light? Oh, 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 Will yeah. you see what they have done? No more nuclear war. Will you choose to stand and fight? This is war. Will you choose to carry a gun? Or listen to the revolution? I said I want a solution. Oh, to this everyday pollution. Oh, Jah Jah, give me resolution. Oh, give me that, oh, give me freedom. I know I ain't never gonna kill anyone's score. We're not gonna fight that money, money, war. We're not gonna care about we. Deliver me from the reality. Do you see behind the lies? Yeah, 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 yeah. Will you choose to stand and fight? This is war. Will you choose to carry a gun? Oh, listen to This is why will you choose to carry a gun and listen to the revolution? Oh my lord, listen to the revolution. My beloved, listen to the revolution. Oh my lord, listen to the revolution. Listen to the revolution. What's it? I want to live to lose, son. Who got a deputy for lose, son? Who does a deep and come and give me resolution? Who give me the for give me that I lose, son? Yes. But I'm in the number of the night, I'm in the name of the city, the people, and the number of the money, one of the number 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 of the Listen to the revolution. Oh, 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 oh,